What's going on, Islanders fans? Welcome to the first ever edition of Inside the Isles Live. I'm Aiden Northcott coming to you from my beautiful uh, two-bedroom apartment, uh, guest bedroom here that's been converted to an office in the middle of uh, all of this COVID-19 situation. Uh, hope everybody's staying safe and uh, responsible and healthy and everything that's going that's uh, going on. Hope you're staying uh, home and healthy more than anything else. Uh, today, uh, our first inaugural guest, none other than uh, uh, some might call him an Islanders legend. Uh, I'd probably put him up there, maybe. Um, <laughs> I say that only because he's listening right now. Uh, leader, team franchise leader in penalty minutes, uh, current Anaheim Ducks pro prospect, and fresh off a brand new three-year entry-level contract with the Ducks, Hunter Drew. Hunter, uh, thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join me today. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Yeah, so first and foremost, like I said, congratulations on the contract. Uh, how's it feel to get that? Feels good. I work hard, obviously, my whole life, and to finally have it come true feels nice. That's wicked. So I want to start kind of every interview off here uh, that I'll be doing on this segment going forward with two simple questions. Uh, first and foremost, where are you isolating right now? I'm at home at my parents' house right now. All right. Just chilling. And what's uh what's been your isolation outfit? What's been the the go tos? Uh, well, I got one of them on right now. <laughs> I haven't had to do laundry too much because you don't switch clothes too often. But other than that, just a couple sweaters and some shorts if it's nice out. If it's not, some pants and that's it really. See, I've been rotating through the a same probably three hoodies and. Uh, Three hoodies and two pairs of sweats, the odd pair of jeans if I'm feeling really productive. No chance if I'm putting jeans on. <laughs> Absolutely no chance. So probably no jeans on since your uh, your drive home uh, from San Diego. Was it was it Tulsa you're driving home from San Diego? I drove home from San Diego. From San Diego. So yeah, so that was uh, – I read, uh, read a story there in The Score, uh, which is a great article, by the way. Uh, and talked about your uh, your wild drive home. Tell everybody about that for those who haven't seen it. Yeah, I was I bought my car in California, so I don't have winter tires or anything like that. And I was driving through the Rockies in Colorado in a blizzard, mm -hmm. and I kind of spun out a little bit and almost went over the edge on the right side, and then caught myself and hooked back to the left side and almost smoked a car. So I caught it kind of just in time. I don't know. It's, more luck than anything but obviously it's nice to not you know run into anyone or obviously go off the rocky mountains so you're pretty much on balds then like there was there was nothing gripping the road at that point yeah that, i i was driving with one of my teammates and he had the same thing he he's from sudbury actually ontario but he shipped his car out you know obviously in the summer to san diego so he didn't have winter tires either so we were driving like 10 kilometers an hour just putting down the road to try and get to denver so we could get a hotel for the night 
And then once you got to Denver, from then on, it was smooth sailing at that point once you got to the storm. Yeah, well, we had to stay the night. It was like 11 in the morning, so we had a full day in Denver, which is a great city, but, you know, can't really do anything, obviously, when everything's on lockdown. So we just kind of hung out in the hotel and rested up and then drove, you know, the rest of the way the next day or two. It'll be a must stop on your way back to training camp whenever this uh, this lifts. Absolutely. Right on. So let's get into let's get into the first season then. So obviously you you started the season in San Diego. Um, you had a spell in Tulsa in the ECHL with the Oilers, but uh, overall a lot of the season spent in San Diego. How was it learning from uh, a lot of the veterans that would have been there at the time? Well, I mean it was obviously, you know, well there's just a lot of ways you can describe it. But I think me being a young guy was good. I uh, my roommate was, I think, a five-year vet already at that point. He already had a bunch of NHL games. And he took me in and, um, you know, kind of showed me the ropes off, like, kind of living away from home because, you know, in Charlottetown you have billets. But, you know, in San Diego I was alone. We had a two-bedroom condo downtown. And we just kind of had to do everything for ourselves. It was the first time I've ever had to do that. So he kind of showed me that aspect of things. And then. Uh, we go to the rink and, you know, there's so many older guys, so many guys. I think there was only four or five guys on our team that didn't have NHL games, me being one of them. So obviously a lot of leadership there and a lot of guys that have been through whatever they've been through. And uh, to kind of step into that situation was, was good for me. And, you know, hopefully I can be one of those people in a few years when I kind of go through the ranks a little bit. So who was that roommate? Uh, Anthony stole ours. Okay, so uh, you guys' goalie, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. he's our, one of our goalies. Yeah. Right on. So you would have had a, you would have had a couple teammates that you'd have been pretty familiar with. Two guys that you've already shared a dressing room with, in particular, uh, Daniel Sprong and uh, Alex Dossi. How was it uh, kind of reuniting with some guys who would have uh, shared some fond memories from here in Charlottetown? I mean, it was nice, especially you show up and you kind of see familiar faces right off the bat, so you're not kind of going in blind, but. Um, yeah, I mean, we, I live downtown, Sprong lived downtown and Dusty lived downtown too. And, you know, the three of us live maybe five minutes apart, so I could see them whenever I wanted, and, you know, whenever, you know, if we want to carpool to practice or, you know, go to games or whatever we were doing, just hanging out, we could walk or walk or, you know, drive the two minutes, but whatever needed to be done, we were always doing something and hanging out and, you know, catching up on the time in Charlottetown. And there'd be nothing to do in downtown San Diego either. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's harder to not be busy than it is to be busy, but um, obviously it's a lot of fun being down there, but you know, you got to go and worry about the hockey aspects of things too. So you started the season obviously with at the Anaheim Ducks training camp, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yeah. yeah. So how that would be your second NHL training camp. Um, what would have been the differences from that first one to the second one, a uh, little more experience in your belt, a little more of an understanding of how the process goes. What was that like going through it uh, as uh, not not necessarily a rookie in terms of uh, the training camp experience? Uh, yeah, I mean, the first time I was, you know, I played basically a year and a half a major junior, so I was going in really raw, I'd say, my first year. And then, you know, to go back and uh, come in, Tyler J is texting me right now, making me laugh, but uh yeah to go in you know raw my first year and you know just get the experience was good but then I think going back for that 20 year old year in Charlottetown my third year obviously helped develop me as a you know mature as a person and develop me as a player and I think that uh goes a long way obviously going into your second camp I was there for I think three three and a half weeks I think in Anaheim and um you know you meet obviously a lot of people who've been around for ever and uh you know, I went to San Diego at the end of my uh, 20 year uh, for a month, I think. And the uh, Ducks ended up hiring the San Diego coach who I was with for a month in, in San Diego. So it was nice to, you know, have that kind of connection to, you know, going into your second camp. And, he, you know, I think he likes me. He's a, he's a good guy. He always talks to me and, um, you know, helps me in any way that I need it. So having that kind of relationship going in obviously helped me in the second uh, aspect of, or sorry, the second year of, of in, in Anaheim. And, um, you know, when you think that after my first year, I was going back to Charlottetown. So, you know, maybe 
they didn't really want me to miss much of the year in Charlottetown. But when I was going into San Diego, the season starts later in the American League. So um, they kept me around for a little longer in, in Anaheim this year or last year, whatever. And, and uh, you know, obviously got more experience there, uh, sticking around a little bit longer than I did, you know, the year before. So you may not have the answer to this question because I was kind of curious uh, in thinking of and doing some like a little bit of research and something that I totally forgot about in particular with the Anaheim Docks training camp is there would be kind of a different atmosphere this year. This was the first year in probably 15, 16 years that Corey Perry wasn't at a training camp. Uh, was that something that was mentioned much like with uh, with him not being there? Like he was faced the franchise for so long. Yeah, I mean, I think it was something for the old, like, obviously, you know, I was only there one year with them, but right. a lot of those older guys, like, you know, Gus Lafrakel, Gibson Miller have been around for however long they played together. You know, some of them almost 10 years. Like, like you know, when you see those kind of guys uh, talking about it, just thinking of, you know, the memories that they had playing together and um, whatever things they've been through, you know, they won cups together and, you know, some tough losses together, everything like that. So um, for them, it was definitely weird, I think, but, for me, I just in my own kind of experience, like when you look at a guy like that who's been around forever and, you know, you can kind of watch him. But, you know, the second year when I went, like you said, he wasn't there. So um, kind of switched the focus to someone else. But um, it was obviously a little bit weird, you know, considering, like you said, he was pretty much the face of the franchise for years. Yeah, no, it's so it's like it's funny even for like a, obviously for a fan to even see him in like a in a Stars jersey, and obviously, like, I can only imagine what it would have been like in the dressing room there uh, without having that that stable leader who's who's been there for so long. So, kind of shifting gears and going back to San Diego here, you go into your first year, um, I think the start of the year, if I'm, again, correct me if I'm wrong, kind of in and out of the lineup, learning the ropes is what it means to be a pro. Um, what was that like? Who were some of the guys that took you under your wing? You obviously mentioned the Stolars. Was there any, like, Anybody from that defensive core who really kind of led you and showed you like this is what it means to be a pro at the at the minor league level and this is where you're going to need to go to get to the NHL level. Yeah, I had a few guys. One of them, Chris Weidman, who played in Ottawa when I was a little bit younger. So you know where I'm from in Kingston's only a couple hours from there, so all the games are on TV. So kind of someone that I watched for you know three or four years that he was in Ottawa, and um, I met him and. You know, obviously we had a lot of things to talk about because, you know, I've been to Ottawa a million times and, um, you know, just talking about the city itself and what it was like to play there. And um, we had a good connection and um, he, yeah, like you said, showed me the ropes. And, you know, another guy, Pat Seeloff, he, we ended up trading him on uh, New Year's Eve, I think, but um, he was a guy I'd, I'd hang out with. He took, you know, we'd go to dinner and talk and, you know, whatever, whatever I was dealing with, he would kind of help me out. Same with Weidman and. Um, you know, when you have a couple guys like that, that you can look at and lean on when things are going wrong, like Seeloff was my partner, you know, the whole year until he got traded for whatever half the year. And um, obviously we had a lot of things going on. We were always together on and off the ice. So like I said, when you have someone that you can lean on like that, that's, you know, more than just a teammate, but a friend, uh, obviously that's, you know, that's big for me coming in in my first year. Did he coach you on the Haunted Mansion? <laughs> Yeah, that was that was tough. I don't know. I I don't know if I'll ever live that down. But if that for was, anybody who hasn't seen the video, you gotta head over to the San Diego Gulls YouTube page once this is done, and uh, just type in Hunter Drew Gulls. It's the first one that comes up. Um, him and one of his teammates going through a haunted mansion at Halloween time. I laughed so hard the entire time. <laughs> Not funny for me. It was brutal. Worst <laughs> 25 minutes of my life. <laughs> well, they condense it into like probably some of the most entertaining five minutes I've had uh, in a while. <laughs> um, so oh, you go through, you got, you obviously you get the, that first NHL or NHL, sorry, AHL goal. Um, few fights along the way. Uh, AHL is notoriously known for a lot of tough customers. A lot of guys going through. Um, a lot of uh, locker room leaders, if you will, in that sense. Um, yeah. Were there many of those guys in your team that kind of helped you and be like, okay, you fought a lot of junior guys. This uh, how, this is how you do it at this level. Do you have any of those in your team? I think Seeloff was a tough guy, wasn't he? Yeah, Seeloff's pretty tough. We had another guy, Luke Gazdick, who was oh. a tough guy in Edmonton. 
for, you know, his job was to protect Taylor Hall and his last year there was McDavid's first year. So he had that role to kind of take care of those guys. So, you know, he's fought some of the toughest guys. I mean, he might be the toughest guy I've ever met, let alone, you know, played with, but he's fought some tough guys. And he, I remember I actually fought him in practice one time and like as a joke and he was just showing me some stuff and he actually hit me in the, in the cheek by accident. And it wasn't hard. Like for him, it wasn't hard, but I thought I broke my cheekbone in like a million pieces because he's just so strong. His hands are like so big. And uh, anyway, he was, that was a tough one to take in the face, but um, yeah, he showed me a lot. He would, you know, not just me, all the young guys he'd play around with and, you know, kind of show us whatever we wanted. We were always picking his brain because, you know, he has some, some real good fights, fought some real tough guys. And, you know, like I said, obviously the hockey part of it's one thing, but to have, you know, learn those kind of skills on the other side of it's obviously nice, especially when you can do it from a guy like that. I should say you got a lot of guys around you, like you said, like a guy's like, like a seal off who have that tough sandpaper side to their game and guys who have been around, like you said, like, you know, I, I, I remember you said Luke Gads, like, I'm like, how did I even forget that, that he would have been your teammate? And like, I remember watching him, like, like you said, like protecting Taylor Hall, like when I was in high school and it's like, yeah. man, this guy's like, yeah. that's a tough, tough customer. But you also had a lot of, Big. a lot of skill guys too. Like you would have had, um, like a Sam Carrick, you would have had obviously Daniel Sprung, yeah. Maxim Comtois, I think for a lot of the Q fans would obviously recognize yeah. that name. And, um, who were some of the guys that would have leaned on to help you know, develop that well-rounded game for you because that's obviously a big part of being a pro, not just being able to, you know, chuck fists anymore. Yeah, it's, I mean, we had our co- our coaching staff, I think between the DE coach and the head coach, it's like over 2,000 games in the NHL and yeah. over like 2,500, 3,000 as a coach. It's uh, Kevin Deneen's your coach, NHL, right? AHL, so, yeah. yeah. Kevin Deneen's a head coach, yeah, and uh, Sylvain Lefebvre's the, the D coach who I'd work with every day, kind of like I did with Guy uh, in Charlottetown. And, um, you know, those two guys on the coaching side of things obviously helped me a lot. But um, players, like you mentioned, Sam Carrick, he's, you know, he was our captain. He's a good leader. He, you know, he has NHL games. He's, you know, been up and down a million times, whatever. He's He's been through it all. He's been in San Diego for, I think, four or five years. Um, you know, you see a guy like that in practice, a guy you can battle, you know, just get better, like, playing those guys in practice like you don't even you know obviously the games help but every day you're going up against these guys that are skilled tough they play hard you know they back check they're whatever they're grinding in practice like get you you know get you going more as a player more as a as a person it just shows you the level of compete that it takes to play in the american league let alone you know that next step to the nhl so now i gotta ask the question i'm gonna shift gears really hard here because uh, I'm getting some comments on Facebook uh, with regards to it. Uh, Jake Murphy, obviously, uh, pointing this out. And a uh, question I had for you right off the top. What, what is going on with that mustache, man? It's beautiful, isn't it? It's, uh, that's a word you could use to describe it. <laughs> yeah, I'm taking a lot of heat. My mom's giving it to me every day about it. But whatever, I don't even care. There's nothing else to do. So I might as well have something to play with. Just do this all the time choose you choose the face that you get to wear you get to like shave you're obviously shaving because the rest of your face is clean shaven <laughs> you choose to just rock the mustache i mean like you said nobody's seeing you so oh yeah a couple of my buddies are doing it too so we're sending some snapchats back and forth laughing at each other so it keeps it fun I'm not gonna lie ethan crossman motivated me to shave my head because it was it was awful it was like the the longest my hair had been and I don't know how long. It's why I'm wearing a hat right now because it looks it looks awful. No, so. if I took my hat off, you'd puke. I think I, I can't. I even got the Charlton Islanders hat on, just throwing it back. Respect, love, love that you're uh, you're rocking the logo. I appreciate it. Um, so let's talk about that time in Charlottetown. Let's uh, let's focus on that. Obviously, so many memories, so many that uh, still get brought up from time to time. Uh, I asked this question to everybody, and I think I know the answer right off the get go. What's probably like the, the fondest memory that stands out? At least on the ice. I'd say second, my second year, I was 19. We had that third round, game seven loss to Blainville. I mean, it's obviously bittersweet. It was a hell of a run we went on, but tough to lose, especially, you know, the team, you know, the team that ends up winning, it's Bathurst, so you kind of, we battled with all year and we beat, I think we went five and three or six and two against them, like, throughout the year, and obviously they had a dream team, so. I think if we could have beat Blainville, which 
you know, if we had home ice, I think in that game seven, I think we would have beat them for sure. And, you know, like I said, we had a good record against Bathurst or a good rival. You know, our building obviously was packed. You Dude, know, how many first, times, second, third round. How many times do I hear, even now, like uh, your, your bill at the Father Jeremy, obviously making the comment on Twitter not that long ago. Like, it seems to be like a very common thing. Everyone's like, if we get to the finals, yeah. like, we have a really good chance against Bathurst. Who knows what happens? But I mean, that's just the way I hockey think, goes. Right? I think we would have been in Regina. I, I think we would have been in Regina. Wouldn't have had any doubts, any doubts in my mind. What I uh, play with uh, Antoine Moran too in San Diego. Right, he, that's uh, right. Was on that Bathurst team, and he tells me every day, like he's like, I he he yeah, he actually told me a story that they all those guys got together and watched uh, our game seven against Blainville because they didn't want to play us like they were terrified he, he told us like he said i think you would have beat us straight up i think you guys were better than us that's amazing that's such an amazing story that's that'd be a funny one for if that series had ever happened if we play what could have been i can only imagine jeremy would have been beside himself whether he's cheering for mitchell or cheering for you so oh. <laughs> exactly hey right on so let's talk about the talk about some of your teammates uh off off the ice from Charlottetown. like obviously you probably I'm, I'm sure you keep in contact with nearly all of them you know, who are some of those guys yeah, that yeah. you really got around with and uh, really kind of like I've stuck with you, not just as friends, but like on the ice, but like friends off it now that your career's kind of passed along. Yeah, I was a big one. Uh, Derek Gentile was my roommate uh, my last year uh, before we traded him. But even from the minute we picked him up uh, halfway through our my 19 year old year there, we hung out pretty much every day. Cam asked you, you know, him and Gentile were roommates at the time and you know, we'd go over, I'd go over, they'd come over every day and we'd whatever, hang out and do whatever, you know, Gregor McLeod's another guy I talked to all the time. He was my first roommate in Charlottetown before we traded him. Um, you know, obviously Keith Getz and PO, we actually, Budgel, uh, Budgie made a group chat, a poker group chat the other day and all the boys were on playing. There's probably like, you know, 15 guys on there playing. Um, That's unreal. From, yeah, young guys from when I was there, like, Thomas Casey, who's obviously not a young guy now, but at the time when I was there, I think he was 17 and, you know, guys like that, you just kind of connect all the way through and, you know, it's nice to get on. We actually come on Zoom, uh, you know, playing poker and uh, doing the Zoom call so you can kind of see everyone and catch right. up and talk and, um, you know, just kind of see where everyone's at and, um, yeah, catch up. Do you do the, uh, did you do the house party one? Have you played that, done that one yet? No. <laughs> Yeah, been on house party a couple times. That's Thomas Casey's. Uh, that's where he spends his time, I think. Between that one and TikTok, man, that guy's a TikTok star. <laughs> TikTok, I don't know. We got to talk to him about that. <laughs> um, so did you cross many paths with uh, your teammates? Like you mentioned Cam Askew. I know you had spent a little time in the ECHL. You didn't happen to cross paths with him at the time, did you? No, I think they actually went on a road trip. I was only there for two weeks, like right, right before all this happened, but, but they went on a road trip. Tulsa went on a road trip early in the year and played him in South Carolina, but I wasn't there at the time. But, you know, obviously I don't hope that I'm in the, the coast <laughs> in the next year or anything like that, yeah. but hopefully we cross paths again and we can catch up and you yeah, know, the guys see guys like that, guys that are all over. Yeah, for sure. And the guy's been scoring almost – We'll say at will, but he's been a high scoring guy for at the ECHL level the last couple of years. Hopefully he gets a gets a sniff at the next level soon. But you mentioned obviously sure um a guy like you mentioned Gregor, like probably would have crossed paths with him. Like have you seen many of the guys from your team, like PO, um, Gregor, any anybody like that, uh, on your travels? Yeah, we played uh I think we played Gregor four times this year. So right. I had him over him and Joel Valeno came over for uh, dinner. Uh, they were in town for four or five days, and we went there to Grand Rapids for four or five days. So when he was in San Diego, I brought him over, and we had dinner and, you know, hung out a few times in that four or five-day span. And then same thing, we went to Grand Rapids. I, I went to his place, and, you know, we were hanging out and catching up and, you know, whatever, get grabbing dinner, like I said. And um, P.O., he's on the – he – I would have I would have played him – I think 10 times or eight times or whatever it is, but he obviously got traded to, to uh, Pittsburgh and Wilkes-Barre and their American league team. It's, you don't cross over. So I, I never, I didn't see him at all, but um, you know, obviously you don't know what the future holds. You never know. Hopefully I can see those, you know, guys like that again, 
you know, catch up, grab dinner. Same thing I was doing with Gregor. For sure. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's a tougher in a sense because you're obviously your West coast. Like those guys are, you know, playing more like the Michigan, Pennsylvania, you only see them so often, yeah. but it's nice. Like you said, because when they do come to town or when you go there, it's on a swing. So they're second in the area for a couple of days. Like I imagine if they're doing the West coast trip, it'd be probably like a Tucson, yeah. San Diego, Ontario rip or. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. Bakersfield stocked and they right. play like, I think they played like three or four teams and they, they went on a big one, like a two and a half week trip or something. And, okay. Um, you know, they played, two or three teams whatever they did and you know obviously when teams come to san diego especially when you're coming from grand rapids it's obviously a little bit different you yeah. know it's february and you're wearing shorts and a t-shirt so you know i took them you know they went to the beach and i took them you know like i said i live downtown and i took them around downtown and yeah. just kind of showed them around a little bit that's gonna be hard in a sense like not that it becomes a vacation because obviously you're in the middle of a road trip but uh like th that'd be really hard to be a lot of distractions especially going from like you said grand rapids in the middle of winter like you're probably leaving 20, 30 centimeters of snow and heading yeah. for plus 20 weather. So, yeah, we get the reverse of it. We leave the <laughs> the palm trees and show up to the snowstorms, which isn't oh. ideal by any means. But <laughs> hockey, you just go where you got where you got to go. That's just it. So, like you, you know, it's a great kind of lead into the my next question. I guess more going forward for you, like what. Uh, well, obviously the big goal now with that, you know, Brands Bank and new contract is to, to get to the next level. But uh, what's your goal for for next season in particular? I mean, hopefully next year is still going to be going on. Yeah, but, whatever next season um, looks like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll, you know, hopefully, you know, I mean, I'll go to Anaheim first and, you know, take my crack at that. And, um, you know, hopefully get in a few preseason games uh, to start you know, for training camp and then see what happens there. And then, you know, I'm sure I'll end up in San Diego for a while and probably, probably for the whole year to develop, obviously, you know, it's only, it'll only be my second year pro. So, um, you know, hopefully just play well. And then, you know, I have a three-year deal. So within the three years, obviously try and make the jump full time. But if I can, uh, you know, get a couple of games in, in the first year or two, whatever, get, you know, get my feet wet, basically, that would obviously be, you know, a good setup for the last year. Right on. Well, uh, anything you want to add uh, to the fans who are uh, tuned in here for the, you know, who've tuned in for almost a half hour now? I don't know. Just nice to see you guys. I miss it. Charlton, I talk about it all the time. Every time we're, we're talking, we talked about it in that poker. Like I said, we were playing poker that everybody was saying that how much you miss Charlton and Sprong, Dosti used to tell me all the time. It's, you know, you can't beat playing in Charlottetown. It's, not a big spot by any means, but the fans, you know, I'm appreciative for everything that my billets and the fans, you know, all my teammates, every, you know, coaching staff as well, everything that kind of tied into my time there. And, um, you know, I just want to say, hopefully they keep making it a special place for everyone else. And obviously I'd like to get back down there at some point and kind of relive some of those memories and see what happens. Well, uh, Hunter, I appreciate you, uh, taking the time uh, out of your, like I said, busy schedule, I'm sure, um, to, t to drop by and chat uh, and be the, uh, the guinea pig for this, uh, for this Inside the Isles. Uh, yeah, just uh, continue to keep staying safe and uh, chat soon. Yeah, perfect. Thanks for having me on. Take care. All right, you too, man. That was Hunter Drew uh, dropping by. Uh, I'll get him to stick around for a few seconds just to wrap up. And uh, anyways, uh, Islanders fans, Thanks very much for tuning in. Uh, you'll have an announcement here soon in the next couple of days as to who our next guest will be. But in the meantime, hope you stay safe. Hope you have fun. And we will chat to you soon. Thanks very much. Talk to you later.